welcome to Basic Black. Some of you are joining us on our broadcast and others of you are joining us on our digital platforms. I'm Callie Crossley, host of Under the Radar 89.7. Tonight, running for health, wellness, fitness, and community. We, like you, are dealing with the effects of the coronavirus pandemic and are taking precautions. We are working with limited staff and our guests are joining us remotely. 30,000 marathon runners are back to compete in one of the best long distance races, the Boston Marathon. This 126th marathon will also pay tribute to 50 years of women running the race. Professional and amateur athletes from 122 countries and all 50 states will sprint the 26.2 miles route through greater Boston neighborhoods and towns heading to the Boylston Street finish line in downtown Boston. But Boston Marathon runners are overwhelmingly white, with the notable exception of foreign athletes of color. Local black and brown running advocates are working to increase the number of American marathoners of color by challenging issues and safety concerns and by touting running's health benefits. Joining us remotely, Adrian Bitten, member BAA Board of Governors and member of Black Girls Run and the National Black Marathoners Association. Thaddeus Miles is an award-winning photographer and founder of HoodFit. Ruben Sansa, a 2012 Olympian and co-chair for the adult and youth running cohort, Boston Running Collaborative. And Dr. Charles Anderson, president and CEO, Demet Community Health Center. Welcome to you all. So I want to begin by pointing out that you all are part of a uh, small cohort of people, a statistic, if you will, because less than 20 percent of all runners identify as black. And so here the four of you are. So I want to start um, by uh, just getting a tiny bit of how you got into running and to lead us to where you are now. So I'll start with you, Thaddeus. I know that it grew out of wanting to alleviate some some depression and some mental health issues. Yes. So, so I've always been an athlete. I was an All-American, high school All-American, went off to college and in the military. So ended up running, uh, but doing very little of the distance running. Uh, but as I moved through and started to look at the health disparities in Roxbury compared to the Back Bay, I started to look at what can we do to address some of those challenges. But at the same time, I was having uh, some challenges with my own family and some people within my family that were struggling with mental health issues but did not want to take any medication or do any of those things. So we ended up talking about it and talking to some specialists and they said that we needed to do more movement and to, to push through and not just go to the gym and lift, but to also to get out and to run and to dance and to do some other things. And so running was the easiest thing, and it really helped us to address a lot of those mental health issues, address some of the stress that we were dealing with, and to be able to reduce uh, some of those other health issues as high blood pressure and diabetes that we were struggling with at the same time. Yes, and we should add, um, as I'm moving over to you, Adrian, um, that there's plenty of scientific evidence that running helps increase those brain endorphins. The, that the stuff that's in your brain that really elevates your mood and reduces stress and anxiety. So that's exactly what was happening for Thaddeus. Uh, you were inspired to <laughs> run by your sister, Adrian. Um, tell yes. us about that. <laughs> yes, well, uh, my sister happened to run a 5K. And at that time, I couldn't even run a mile. Um, I have high blood pressure and, and some other things. And I've always exercised and tried to eat healthy but had never really run. So I started with the Couch to 5K program. Uh, you know, it says walk and now run and walk. And I used to do that in my suits. And then, then after a while, that was not practical. <laughs> so, so kind of advanced from there. But I've only been doing this since 2014. I didn't start running until I was in my 50s. So that means that anybody can, you know, start it wherever you are um, and begin. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, what I always say is that if you can get out for 15 minutes a day and just walk in one direction for 15 minutes and come back the other 15 minutes, you will make an enormous difference in your life. And usually you really can't see a lot of difference until after about maybe 30 days. So you have to just be very patient with yourself. Also, men tend to see results quicker than women. 
So um, us women, we have to be a little bit more patient with ourselves and a little kinder to ourselves. But, uh, but absolutely, if you get out there and just move a little bit more than you normally do, you can make a real difference in your life. Okay. Uh, Ruben, so you got inspired by some youth programs. That, though this running was not on the top of your list to do anything, and then you, those youth programs got you interested, um, and then all the way to the Olympics? My goodness. Yes. Um, so actually, uh, I have come to the U.S. in 1999 from, uh, from Cape Verde. And at the time, I was in my English class, and uh, one of my teachers came in and said, you know, who wants to run cross country? And I thought we were running across the country. So I signed up. And, uh, uh, and later, I found out that it was a BAA's middle school cross country program. And um, so I did the program. You know, I finished 16th in my, in my race at the Dearborn Middle School. And uh, later on, I, I was questioning myself, how come some of my friends who ran with me in middle school, um, you know, they're not running in high school? And what I started to find out really is that as, as we got older, we stopped doing a lot of the things that, that we did when we were younger. So I, I started to, you know, having those conversations with the Boston Athletic Association and starting to really trying to understand how we can increase the participation, retentions, and growth of uh, running and walking uh, for uh, Boston Public School students. And for me, luckily, I went to the O'Brien High School, uh, which traditionally has had a great um, track and field program. And I continued running through, uh, through college and post-collegiate. And somehow I had the opportunity and I took advantage of it, I competed here locally, uh, both locally and regionally um, here in the U.S. And I found myself at the 2012 Olympic Games. Uh, Dr. Anderson? Of course, you're all about health. Uh, you have many degrees. One of them's in public health, uh, as well as, uh, you know, just the physical doctoring health that, that you do as well. Um, what, what really inspired you to run? Because there are many other ways that you could be exercising, but running specifically connected with you. Sure. Well, like many of the others, I was involved with sports growing up and, you know, through college, never at a significant level, but just really enjoyed the competitive spirit that sports uh, allowed. Uh, all along the way, never really knew anyone who ran. That just wasn't something that we did. As I went through medical school and I learned more about the benefits of things like running and, uh, you know, the specific impact that it has on our heart and our ability to develop these reserves, and then learned a lot more about those natural endorphins and just all these things in terms of one's stress, it always lingered with me. And then when I started my fellowship in newborn intensive care here at the Brigham Women's Hospital and the stress of that, I found myself starting to run around the muddy river there. And uh, before I knew it, I was hooked. All right. So now let's talk about the absence of, of folks of color in what is perceived as a white space, this running space. And uh, all of your efforts uh, collectively, really, to break down that barrier and to open up these spaces. So Thaddeus, um, you are working with uh, Dr. Charles Anderson and the DEMIC in a program. Talk about that and uh, why it's so necessary for it to be so that uh, other black folks can sort of get interested in running. Yeah, well, I've, as, a, uh, as an athlete, I've always thought about running no more than 100 yards on the football field or 94 yards on the, uh, the, on the basketball court. And I re really didn't think about running through the community. But as I thought about just joining uh, and looking at that mental health issue, I started to look at races, uh, 5K races. I, I always need a goal, right, to complete something for myself. And I saw that there were none happening in Roxbury. Uh, so I started this organization called Hood Fit uh, and started to uh, think about doing a 5K in Roxbury. We did our first 5K. We didn't have, uh, it wasn't official, it, uh, we just took over the streets to show the community that is your neighborhood and you can run through your community. Uh, we then partnered with the, the DEMIC organization and the BAA and created an atmosphere that we could actually run. So we went from 126 people running the first race to over a thousand people that run now. We have a pavilion, uh, a health pavilion that people can come in and check up on their health during, those, uh, during the race. But I think what's most important for me is every race that we've had in the last 
uh, seven, eight years, somebody has told me that this race, this run has saved their life mm -hmm. uh, in many different ways. Uh, and so and it actually saved mine too. And so when I look at, we have a walker, we have a young lady, I'm going to say young lady, she's probably in her 70s, that every year has been there with a walker and walks the, the, the 3K. Uh, and it's been a uh, it's been a major influence for me to continue moving that forward. We've had people that are starting their chemo the next week that have came for encouragement uh, and, and being able to connect and have that social interacting and also have those affirmations that you need that you can do it, that you can move forward and that you can con continue to still be resistant and continue to fight all of those challenges that we deal with every day as being black people. Um, so Adrian, I think what people uh, don't know if they're listening to this conversation is that you, so people say, so, okay, so it's a white space. You know, what's different about that? Most black people are in some space that's overwhelmingly white. But, you know, there are so also some issues uh, that people are, that concern black folk around running, safety issues and uh, concern about, you know, stigma, all of that. You're on the, the first African-American woman, by the way, on the Boston Athletic Association board. That's the group that organizes and runs the Boston Marathon. It's quite a big honor. Um, and you're also associated with a program trying to break down these barriers. So talk a little bit about some of these concerns that, that folks may not know about that impact folks of color. Yes, well, one thing I always like to make a distinction about is that there is safety in running, but then there's black people's safety in running. And when you talk about general safety in running, you talk about things like, you know, wearing a reflective vest or making sure that that you run during more daylight hours and things of that sort, that you run going towards traffic instead of along with traffic and all those other things. For black people, it really boils down to the, the systemic racism in our society and and really where black people can and can't go because of who they are. And 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 that's a different type of safety issue. Uh, you know, I look at as look at it as, you know, we have to really begin to address the systemic racism in our in our society. Now, how does some of that happen? Well, how some of that happens because we have to get allies and people who know that they need to change, who know that they need to speak up, who know that that they need to sort of open their doors up a lot more. Uh, for example, my invitation to to come on the board of board of governors for the Boston Athletic Association, you know, folks had to be willing to give up some power to do that, you know, because it changed the dynamic. Once I came on board, people I may have known and worked with with these other external initiatives, but then when I come inside, all of a sudden, you know, I have a say so in terms of what they do and how, how they move forward. So, um, so basically we have to create some bridges. So we have to do things like the Boston Running Collaborative that will enable folks who, who are sort of on the front line, the run groups who are running every day, who live in our city to be able to, to say, hey, here's some of the things we wanna do. Here's some of the things we know will work. And they just need help from organizations like the Boston Athletic Association to maybe help finance some things or maybe connect them together. And as a matter of fact, organizations that belong to and run groups that belong to the Boston Running Collaborative, they have now started getting together because they now see each other and they're able to collaborate on things like talking about how do we create additional races within our community? How do we... Um, find pathways for jobs and careers in track and field, for example. You know, how do we, you know, how does somebody become an elite runner? You know, how, how do you do all these things? And I think that we have an amazing opportunity right now to, to, to support this. And uh, organizations like the BAA are very willing now to, to really support the community. And, and one thing I always like to say is that the Boston Athletic Association one of our major events is the Boston Marathon, but the mission of the Boston Athletic Association is to really promote the health and wellness of, of our community. Mm -hmm. And so we're starting to really dig more in the trenches of that, you know, and, and um, events like the Boston Marathon and other events that we have help to fund that work. All right, so Ruben, 
you are right in the midst of doing the Boston uh, Running Collaborative work. And again, I just want to remind people, as Adrian has done so well, about what folks of color have seen in the past that didn't seem inviting. So when we look at the images of the Boston Marathon, I know that's their signature event, no folks of, of color except maybe foreign people, maybe folks from Africa. We've seen those. We see a lot of white people there, but we do not see um, just your average black Americans as a part of the scene, even though we know that all of you have run, well, not uh, Dr. Anderson, but everybody has uh, run the, the marathon, and certainly folks like yourself, Ruben, have done so. So when we talk about having some initiatives in the community that would foster more of this. One of them is training facilities. And I know you're involved with the young people on this. So talk about what impact that could make in opening up these spaces. I think, um, you know, as a runner, um, I was always concerned about where I was training at all times. Uh, where could I actually get in my run? Um, because not just facilities, but also spaces that I feel safe. Um, my parents, when I was young, they were always concerned about my running safety because, you know, a couple of times I've been stopped by, by people just asking me, what am I doing? I've been, I've been attacked on runs before. And uh, when you think about uh, Boston, um, we usually, you know, there, there are a lot of facilities that, that exist that we don't, have, we don't actually have enough space where we can bring in um, our, our people of color, you know, the black community. There's no space in Dorchester where we can say, hey, here's a closed facility where you can train year-round. And I think it's important to try to promote um, health and wellness from an aspect of providing access where individuals can, they don't have to travel far, um, they can actually go and, and be able to train. And I think now I'm, I'm starting to see a lot more than before uh, groups, of, uh, groups of runners who are normalizing running down the streets of Roxbury, Mattapan and Roxbury uh, and, uh, and Dorchester. And I think that that it changes the, uh, it sort of like changes the culture a little bit that it's okay. You can go out outside and run. Uh, we have more groups doing organized group runs. There are lots of organizations and I can name a few, you know, Pioneers Run Club, Black Girls Run, Boston United, um, that are working to be able to provide access to running within these neighborhoods. And as you said, you don't have to run just to become a marathoner. That's not the point, right, Ruben? Right. I, and I, I think sometimes we associate running with, oh, you know, you're doing the Boston Marathon. People ask me that all the time when I'm training. Usually my answer is yes. Uh, you know, let's let's run. But you don't have to do a marathon. Uh, you know, if you're on the couch, you can get up and go for a jog. If you're jogging a 5K, maybe you, you make it a goal to do a, a half marathon. Uh, but you don't have to do a full marathon to, to consider yourself health and an and active participant. And uh, Dr. Anderson, I'm letting you pick up on that because I'm teasing you because you have said you're not running a marathon, but you run two or three times a week. Um, and that's an example of what we're talking about here. And I, I actually wish that in your answer, too, you would talk about just the pride uh, that has grown out of these groups, uh, really bringing uh, a, a, a sport and an activity, an exercise activity that had long felt off limits back into our communities. Sure. Well, we see that. I mean, that's the big, I mean, it's amazing that, you know, it, it took, you know, Thaddeus Miles saying, look, we need to get out and do this with all the data that helps us understand the value of running and exercising. And we could do a whole segment and maybe we should at some point. So people really, really understand what happens when you exercise and how you improve your heart's ability to function and your lungs ability to function, which now cascades into your ability to fight off infection and everything else. But you know, one of the key things we see with the road to wellness is when you get out there and I've participated and I ran last year and I participate in all the training as well. And you see the pride that we take as we set goals and achieve those goals. But also you see as we run through the neighborhood and people are looking and they're seeing maybe for the first time groups of people who look like them running. It allows you to understand that connection between if I can see it and I can picture myself doing it, I'm much more likely to do it. And with that, everyone who participates in this road to wellness race through, it's only the, the only race that goes through the, the city of Roxbury, the only road race that goes through the town of Roxbury. 
And when people are participating in that run, they have that real feeling that they are sending a message to their neighbors and that they are making a difference. And they're part of this whole health and wellness promotion that we're, we do at the Demick Center. Yeah. This is about how you engage people in, what, in their health and wellness, how we have those conversations that influence the way we're treated when we show up for care. This is really what it's about. We're informing ourselves, we're informing each other, and we're doing this together in community, which it doesn't get any better than that, as you can see from these amazing pictures. Mm -hmm. I just want to cite a statistic that will warm your heart. 2017 review in the Journal of Progress in Cardiovascular Disease found that runners have at least a 30% risk, lower risk of death from all causes compared to non-runners. And here's one. And a 45% reduced risk of death from cardiovascular or heart disease. So those are huge numbers and obviously speak to um, that connection, that health connection. Um, you've spoken about the pride connection. Now I want each of you to tell me what it feels like from you from a joy basis to run. Um, Thaddeus, you're wearing a shirt that says Black Joy. So tell me, at, when you are running, wh what's that like for you? Uh, so for me, when I'm running, so first I want to say I have not ran the Boston Marathon. <laughs> I am scheduled to run next year. I was supposed to run when the pandemic hit. Okay. Uh, so I'm glad I got the two-year break. Uh, <laughs> and uh, But I've ran the five or ten and a half marathon. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, it's really freedom. It is a sense of uh, freedom. When I start off running, I, I say an affirmation to myself and I say a prayer. And I ask God to relieve all of those stresses and all of those challenges to free my mind, to just breathe and know that I'm here and to be grateful and have gratitude uh, and be humble enough to be able to be thankful around it. And so for me, running, whether it's whether I'm running a mile and I'm a run walk guy uh, <laughs> or whether I'm running 10 miles, it's a it's a it's a thing of freedom. It's a ability to tap into me. It's ability to have some mindfulness, to listen to myself breathe, mm. uh, and to be able to like tap into and know my heartbeat and that I'm here and that mm. I have a purpose and I have a direction and something that I need to achieve. And if I don't achieve that purpose, that it won't be done. Okay. Adrian. Well, for me, it it just provides me space. Sometimes life kind of closes in on us between work and family and just all of our responsibilities and the fact that, you know, we care so deeply about so many things. And I think that running gives me the space to kind of reorganize things in my head and also to give myself a hug. Sometimes I just have to give myself that hug and give myself that space. And running definitely does that. Ruben, now tell the truth. Because you're an Olympian, are you out there saying, I can run faster than y'all? Come on now. <laughs> <laughs> I will say, look, you know, there, there are so many health benefits uh, for running. Uh, a lot of people don't actually know I suffered from asthma when I was growing up. Um, you know, when I was, you know, eight, nine, nine years old, I couldn't actually go outside and just play. I would come back huffing and puffing because my asthma was so bad. And through running, I was eventually, um, you know, I was able, able to overcome my running. Um, overcome my asthma. Um, but through running, I was, you know, I was able to, you know, going through high school, uh, setting goals in, in, in high school, in college. And I think that's an in, important aspect uh, when you're, you know, you're growing, you're, um, you're able to set goals similarly to, you know, your academics and, and your sports. I think there, there's a, a, a feeling of accomplishment that, that running brought to my life. And I, I think that that helped me with my academics, with my work, and for my own mental health. But what? But emotionally, how do you feel when you're out there doing it? I mean, I feel great. Just you know, just thinking that hey, this is something that I I, I choose to do. I'm able to do it. Uh, just uh, it, it's great for my own uh, you know mental health and emotionally. I'm happy that I'm able to do it. Able to compete in races. Uh, I've been throughout, you know, I've been to over 20 countries competing. Uh, so running has been a huge part of my life. And uh, it's something that I think, you know, bringing it to other people, providing access for others. Uh, it's something that I quite enjoy doing. Okay. Dr. Anderson, what does it feel like? Give us the details of what it feels like when you're out there running. You know, I think the word that sums it up for me is blessed. Right? I can't help but get out and run. And I have the really the opportunity to run in spaces where, you know, again, here 
and Newton, there's a carriage lane. Not only do I have to worry about, you know, sidewalk and street, there's a whole carriage lane to run. We're not too far from that Heartbreak Hill part of the marathon. And I feel incredibly blessed to have the opportunity to be out and do that. And I turn that blessing into how do I convert that into action to make sure others have the opportunity to do that? There are real barriers. I think one of the ones are, you know, just making sure you see other people doing it, um, and which is why things like we do, like Road to Wellness are so critical. But, you know, how do we really understand how we work together as a community and a society to make sure that we make this accessible and approachable and always keep it affordable uh, for those who aren't having that same blessing that I have. So I feel blessed when I'm out there. I thank God every time I'm out there and come back safely because I get out there sometimes and try to run alongside people that I shouldn't be running alongside. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, but it is, it's an incredible blessing and one that I don't take for granted at all. Is it so somewhat meditative for you when you're out there? It's incredibly meditative. It does allow me to de-stress, takes me away from all of those things that I was previously thinking about because I am focusing on my breathing. Mm -hmm. I'm focusing on my stride. I'm hearing my heart beat because I have my headphones in and they, you know, amplify my, uh, my heart rate, which is great. It reminds me that I'm alive, which is, I think, really critical. And, you know, especially as we're approaching this mental health crisis that we're dealing with, this is why we need to come together and make sure that we have everyone have the opportunity and, and create real on-ramps on for everyone to have the same sort of mental health release and positivity pause, as we call it in our house, okay. um, to be able to regroup. Well, that's a great place for us to end because that's the end of our broadcast and the end of our show. And we thank you all for joining us. And now stay with us as we continue our conversation on our digital platforms, Facebook and YouTube. I'm Callie Crossley, host of Under the Radar 89.7. We're on Facebook and YouTube with our post show, continuing our discussion on tonight, running for health, wellness, fitness, and community. Um, I, so I, the question that I want to put to you all is one that's, in, that's a little bit intriguing. Allison Felix, that may be a name you know, who's a star mm -hmm. of track and field, announced today that she's uh, going to retire uh, soon, and she says it's time for her. That is, to give back to Joy is not about the calendar, it's about uh, Joy. She's the most um, awarded Olympic athlete. This is a black woman. So it's interesting that in a track and field, professional track and field particularly, but I guess you could also include uh, the college athletes, nobody thinks about being out of place if you're a person of color. That that feels like spaces that folks of color have long been in. Whereas running, you know, just through the streets in an amateur way or in a marathon somehow has become a white space. I, I wonder if you all would address that. Why do you think that is? And anybody can start. Just give me a heads up who wants to start. All right, Thaddeus. Yeah, so I live in Lowell. And honestly, the, I've seen Ruben, you know, who works at, uh, in Lowell, come by looking like a gazelle going, <laughs> going by my home, right? <laughs> I was like, all right, let me stay in the house until he gets back in. But I think but the other thing is, is for me, I don't see any other black people running in Lowell. Uh, and it's a, I live right outside of a, a condo where they have a Lowell run group that uh, runs in the summer. And, you know, I'm, I'm coming in and it's, 150 of them, 200, 200 of them gathered out there to, to do their practice run. And I do not see anybody that looks like me. So it's very hard to feel like I belong in that space. Mm -hmm. And even when they are running and I'm, I'm just walking or doing my own little jogging, their attitude doesn't necessarily lend itself for me to feel like I'm belonging. So being able to have my own space uh, is a little bit different. So seeing that and not seeing anybody that looks like me would make me, and, and joining some races and not seeing a lot of people that look like me would make me, or, or sort of have made me have the feeling I don't belong. Whereas, but being able to overcome that mm -hmm. and being able to connect with Ruben and Dr. Anderson and others that actually run and Adrian that, that runs consistently uh, has helped me sort of think about that in a different way. And for me to be able to have the agency to say, this is about me, this is about my health, this is about my community, let me walk out and do what I'm doing. 
but so, but you don't feel that way about track and field. That's my point. Is like, why does that feel yeah. comfortable, you know, for black folks or for, uh, any yeah. any folks of color than the other? So so yeah, I think then it's like I did track and field in high school, uh, then junior high. So running okay. the fifty, running the hundred, the two hundred, the four hundred. We see a lot of us sprinting, and that's what I was saying earlier in the yeah. show. We see a lot of us sprinting, but when it comes to distance and just running for the joy of running mm -hmm. versus training, those for me are two different things. Gotcha. Adrian. Well, also, um, I think it comes down to if you can see it, you can be it. Mm -hmm. Because, for example, I grew up in North New Jersey uh, during the Ken Gibson days. And uh, I didn't know that he ran the Boston Marathon a few times until probably two years ago, mm -hmm. something like that, because I was just doing some research trying to trying to find more black runners who had, who had run Boston. And so I think it's all about what you're encouraged to do and also how that sport is perceived. The sport of distance running has always been coupled with sort of elitism, mm -hmm. um, uh, higher economic stature. You know, even the folks who are running the Boston Mar Marathon, when you know, Irish people started running it and all that. Folks were like, oh, my. It's like, oh, you know, all these other people are coming in. Mm -hmm. uh, you have people like Eli um, Ellison Brown, who, who is an, an, an indigenous um, uh, American from, from uh, Pawtucket, Rhode Island, who actually, he's the one that caused the heartbreak right. on Heartbreak. That's right. You know? But... But there's not a statue of him on Heartbreak Hill. Right. In fact, his statue should be a little ahead of the other guy's statue. But but it's stories like that that we don't we don't get a chance to hear. And 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 a lot of youth are not necessarily encouraged. Youth of color are not encouraged to you know to engage in distance running. Um, you know, and again, just like uh, Ruben said before, that having to think about where you go to run affects the distance you can run. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so if you can't go further than a mile outside of where you live because you're fearful that you won't be accepted in certain communities, then basically you're probably not going to run more than a mile, mm -hmm. most likely, because you don't want to keep making those loops all the time either, because loops drive me crazy. Mm -hmm. But um, um, eight years ago, um, I started to meet up with Black Boston Marathon runners, and the goal was to number one, help show Boston as a more welcoming place for these runners and also to show these runners that you're seen and that they can see each other. And so I think, you know, um, identifying each other, encouraging each other, initiatives like the BRC, for example, that then branch out and, 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 and want to hear the voices of runners of color will help ch change that. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, I, just to add, I didn't know about Ellison. They call him Tarzan Brown yes. uh, mm -hmm. until last year. And that was only because, as you know, the marathon ended up on the day on Indigenous Peoples Day. Yes. And there yes. was a lot of con conversation about, you know, how do we honor uh, Indigenous people on their day and have the marathon be on it, too. And all of a sudden, this history came up. I was stunned. I had never heard that story before. <laughs> Okay. It is, it is huge history. Yes. Go ahead, Dr. Anderson. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it's, it's again, there's a whole theme we could talk through in terms of the importance of our representation in something and how that changes, especially young people's understanding of it being possible. We can talk about the way the world of golf changed. Yes. And the world of tennis changed. We can, we, we've seen this, so we know it's possible. We know there's a formula there. And one of the things I'm actually really excited to see is the way the BAA has collaborated and partnered with groups like Black Men Run, right? So I think it is Sunday morning, as a matter of fact, I'm gonna be participating in a run there with uh, two and a half miles, mm -hmm. uh, just about my distance, uh, <laughs> with this collaboration with Black Men Run and the BAA mm -hmm. for the shakeout run. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's what's required and we need to televise those things. We need to help young mm -hmm. people and I really focus on younger people and, and a lot of my background and thinking about this because I think, unfortunately, for some of us who are a little set in our ways, it takes a lot more. And actually, when you get the young people excited about it, sometimes they bring the older people into it as well because they say this is just something that we're going to be doing. Uh, but the reality it is about that exposure, Callie. It is 
that is to me the biggest barrier when it comes to this because for myself i can tell you i grew up father from jamaica we don't do distance we're sprinters i was the fastest kid in the neighborhood at 100 <laughs> yeah. but, but never even thought about anything yeah. beyond that because yeah. i could never visualize myself mm -hmm. doing that because i've never seen anybody do that mm -hmm. um, and that's in, that's important to understand my my father ran the 4 by 100 so it's like okay that's what we do you know we're the fastest people on the planet not necessarily running the longest but we're the fastest people on the planet and that was what was etched into my brain as i kind of explore this we need to expose more young people to this, to this sport and especially focusing on the cardiovascular benefits and the mental health benefits. Because once you start them with this early, you develop these habits when you're in your late teens and early 20s and you continue that habit, they will live longer and live better lives, mm -hmm. period. Mm -hmm. um, Ruben, you wanna weigh in on the why folks see us in the track and field space but don't in the long distance running space? You know, as Dr. Anderson said, uh, it's about exposure. When I was running in, uh, in high school in Boston, uh, I didn't see anyone else, uh, any other uh, black uh, student athlete running distance events. Um, I didn't know anyone. Uh, the only time I saw uh, black distance runners uh, was on TV for the Boston Marathon, and most of them were from Uganda, Ethiopia, and Kenya. It wasn't until uh, one, of my, uh, one of my mentors, Tony DeRosha, Actually, you know, I got to meet him and, and he, you know, he explained to me about his background in running, how he ran at, at my high school and then at BU. Then I started to really understand, oh, there are, there are other black runners, distance runners, but there's, there's only a few. Uh, and I think when you start seeing like, okay, it's possible, you don't have to be from Kenya or from Ethiopia or from Uganda to be a really good, you know, black distance runner. And I'm starting to see that there's a, a little bit of a change that's, that's happening. And I think part of that is being influenced by the groups that we're now seeing running through, you know, Humble, Dav, Blue Hill, and Columbia Road. Um, and I think as we continue to do that, it's go it does take some time. Uh, we're going to be seeing a lot more uh, distance runners, in particularly to track and fields. You know, track and field careers are very short. Uh, mm -hmm. By the time most sprinters get to, you know, 30 years old, they're getting ready to retire. And when I watch the Olympics on TV or, or the U.S. championship, you know, most of the sprinters that I see are black. So if I'm at home, then I'm thinking, okay, I could be a, I could be a really good, you know, sprinter because I'm black. But then you don't see any other, you know, uh, black distance runners. Uh, Jamaica, for example, if you go to Penn, to the, Penn, the famous Penn Relays, it's like a festival there. So, you know, all the Jamaicans are running the sprint events. Mm -hmm. uh, and actually now Jamaica has, has some, is starting to have some really good distance runners. And, you know, Kamoy Campbell, for example, one of them record holder for Jamaica, who was in the Olympics. Um, and I think once we start seeing more exposure to people that look like us that are doing distance events, it's going to help. And uh, as we know, a lot of athletes, they can compete in college, high school, you know, post-collegiate. And once they get to a certain age, they, they just stop. And uh, what we want to, to continue doing is, is, is influence change because we know running should be a lifelong, running or walking or jogging should be a long life uh, objective for most of us to keep improving our health and well-being. Well, I will have to say, uh, just to respond to the, the need to expose, and Adrian can appreciate this, um, I was in Los Angeles visiting my best friend when I first heard about Black Girls Run. This was several years ago. And she said, I'm going to go out. And she is a person that will you know, walk long distances. And she says, I'm starting to do a little run with this group called Black Girls Run. I said, what is that? So anyway, we went. I am nobody's runner. So that's not going to be happening. And I'm nobody's long distance runner. That's not going to be happening either. But I'll walk. So it was fascinating to be in the group where I am walking and people are running, but my point is, the camaraderie was amazing, and you got so excited about it, I can see how, uh, why these chapters have sprung up around the country and why people are encouraged to go back, because you feel very comfortable whatever level you're at. Yeah, we believe that, you know, we leave no one behind. And, and, and basically, that's, that's sort of the mantra of, of the majority of, of run groups of color, because we realize that we have a very 
wide spectrum of, of ability when it comes to running and walking. And, and it's our goal to have to meet everybody where they are and then to encourage them to move forward at, at their pace and know that they have their support. Uh, one thing I can add here is that if you wanna see black runners, black and runners of color who are running the Boston Marathon, we have over 60 that will be at the Reggie Lewis Center on Saturday for our Black Unicorns Celebrate and Connect event. Uh, Thaddeus serves on our steering committee. Ruben will be um, heading up our procession of the runners along with Meb. So it's gonna be a very exciting event. The whole purpose of the event is, is to celebrate these runners, to welcome them to Boston, but also we get to have it at the Reggie Lewis this year, mm, which means uh, the community can come in and see and see these runners. And this is part of you know, how we're gonna be able to sort of bridge, a, create a bridge to Boylston Street, you know? Yes. And, and to let our community members know that there are other runners, other black and brown runners who run Boston that are not the elite runners, you know, that are like your auntie and uncle, you mm -hmm. know? Well, so, uh, so we're very excited about that. And, and, and not, uh, we should not uh, forget to mention that uh, Marilyn Bevins is going to be part of the honorary group of women that's celebrating at the uh, Boston Marathon this year, 50 years yeah. of women running. And she was one of the first to run under three hours, which I yes, can't even yes. fathom. Um, I, I love the documentary that she's in highlighting all of these black women who ran, who run under 30. There's a great rap song that is fabulous that people should listen yeah. to. But, you know, there, so she will be there, too, representing history. And by the way, I never heard of her before this year. Yes, so, yes, you know. yes. And the thing is, is that uh, what, what I can say is that the BAA is like-minded in beginning to do more in ter terms of elevating the visibility of these runners. And Marilyn Bevins is particular, in particular. She is still the only African-American woman who has placed second in the Boston Marathon. And there are other African American women out there who, who have the possibility of accomplishing that. And so, you know, we're in the process of identifying them, and and hopefully we'll be able to invite more African American women to run to run Boston. Okay. All right. Any final thoughts before we close this out? Y'all making me you tired know, just talking, thought, <laughs> Dr. Anderson. One go final ahead. thought I would have is that you know, um, the other leg of this stool is that as much money as I spend with Hoka. And what is Hoka? He's been, they make uh, running shoes. Now. Okay, running got shoes. you. Thank well, you. Say, okay. New Balance, okay. Reebok, okay. et cetera. All right. Somebody's going to figure out that there's an emerging market mm, yes. of BIPOC runners. Yes. And they're going to take some of the people we just talked about, mm -hmm. and they're going to put their name on a shoe. And I would and buy that shoe. Them. I would and buy that gonna shoe. they're going to sponsor them. <laughs> and they're going to be part of what we need to be doing to get more of us into this, what can be a yeah, life-changing and life-saving saving activity. So okay, hopefully they're listening. Carlin, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because I would, we need I, to make that happen. I, absolutely. I would buy that shoe and walk with y'all because I'm not running, Ruben. Don't be looking okay. for me to run. You a walk partner. If you, if you want me to walk with you, I'm game. Okay. I'm down. I'm game. Okay. There's one other thing I just want to mention is when we talk about taking a, and doing our own, the Pioneer Run Club is doing their own 26-2 that's, right. uh, yeah. that's going through the community and looping through Dorchester, Roxbury, and other parts of the community that's not seen or touched as part of the marathon. So hopefully that will actually get people encouraged to be able to step out and, and to join. I'm going to join in in the morning. I'm going to run the first 100 yards and take some photos to make sure that it's documented. Okay. Uh, then I'll be at the end. But, uh, you know, people are out there doing it, and I think – Learning who these run clubs are is a plus and that they're in your community. And I think what Adrian said, there's not leaving anybody behind. So if you can only walk, uh, which is what I do most of the time, that you're still part of it. And we need that social interconnectivity because the overall aspect of the coronavirus and that overall pandemic left us in a lot of social isolation. Mm -hmm. and we as black folks need that to maintain our resilience, but also to continue to push forward and to address some of these systemic racism issues that we need to uh, address, but we also, that we face each and every day. Good place to end on. I thank you all for joining me um, and good luck on all your runs. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>